Assalamu alaikum. I want to ask you a really light question to segue multiple heavy topics. When did you open your first social media account? 2000, 2002, 2004? Maybe it was MySpace? That's what I started with. Uh, some of you may have been in the AOL chat rooms. Some of you were going to really prestigious universities and so you were in the early invitation for Facebook. Maybe you didn't join until Twitter came along. Maybe you're like my parents and you just joined in the last couple of years to keep track of your kids and your grandkids. My mom might be listening right now and let me tell you, she uses social media better than me. My first account was MySpace and then eventually I joined Facebook and it was always a really big deal every time you changed your profile picture and you wrote your status message in the third person. But Twitter is what I remember joining most fondly. I joined Twitter at a time when people in the Muslim majority world were also joining Twitter and they were using it for political organizing. I remember a story of a young man who had been arrested and on his way into custody, he was able to get out a tweet saying what was happening to him. And it was because of that very quick 140 characters that before he disappeared into the abyss of an injustice system, people knew how to get to him and what had happened. I remember tweeting very excitedly as the Arab Spring took on life. 140 characters and I could support a freedom fighter in another country. 140 characters and I could talk about the importance of self-determination for Muslims. 140 characters and I could be part of an important conversation, taking part on the global stage. I don't know that I could have imagined at that time that social media would become the weapon of war that it is today. What started out as something fun and cute and social and even intended to drive movements has now become a tool for harm and destruction and hatred. And you've heard that from the other speakers today. Across the world, these platforms put many of us in danger. In the United States, we saw how social media was used to spread misinformation about COVID. Remember the like, if you hold a hairdryer down your throat, you could burn COVID out? I actually watched that video because somebody sent it to somebody who sent it to somebody on WhatsApp. And it was a legitimate conversation that happened. There was, of course, everything our former president was saying about COVID, which spread on Twitter. There were people who believed these falsities. They would rather believe what a viral tweet said than what science said. We saw what happened with the election. The right wing used social media over and over again to try to undermine the election, to send incorrect messages about election day, to sway people on candidates with falsities, and then to actually question the outcome of the election. We know that so much of the January 6th Capitol attack organizing happened on social media. In the Muslim community, many of us have heard stories about how law enforcement targets our use of social media. If anyone ever messages you on Facebook and says that they are from the Taliban, run the other way. That is a police officer or an FBI agent. And of course, we see day in and day out how Islamophobia is spread in the US via social media. Dr. Hatim was scheduled to be here tonight and could not make it, and all of us among the speakers have been remiss about who would address the gravity of what he would say about Palestine. Briefly, I'll mention that we know that the Israeli occupation forces use social media to put forward their narrative. 
I saw a message today from someone who had a picture of Israeli occupation soldiers dragging a Palestinian saying they're just doing their job and enforcing the law. And so we see how apartheid in Palestine, how Zionist ideology is spread through social media. You heard from our first speaker about how Hindutva is spread via social media. There is literally a genocide watch. Imagine being in this moment in history and hearing over and over and over again that we are on the verge of a genocide in India. Social media in India is used to put forward images of Muslims being harmed, to put forward lies about what Muslims are doing, to organize campaigns, both economic and actually physically violent, against Muslims. Social media is used against Indian Americans who are organizing in the United States. A woman contacted me some months ago. Her picture had been taken, put all over social media, and she'd been offered for sale. Could you imagine? She's sitting somewhere else, horrified to see her face spreading in right-wing Hindu social media circles that way. Over and over again, what we hear from Indian Muslims is that their lives are endangered by the way that right-wing Hindu fascists use social media. The Rohingya. Thousands have been killed. And the role that Facebook and other platforms have played in spreading that hate has led the Rohingya to sue Facebook. To say, you are complicit in this. You are letting this spread. And I will get to the complicity of social media. And of course, we heard from Sheikh Suleiman about the Uyghurs. They can't access social media, but when they are somewhere else, we know that the Chinese government monitors what they say. You could be a Uyghur activist in the United States talking about what is happening to your family, and you cannot tweet about it. You cannot Facebook about it. You cannot TikTok about it. You definitely should not TikTok about it because they will come for your family if you do. What started out as something fun, what many of us still use casually, because let's be real, sometimes I don't want to get up and turn on the television so I'll watch a video on TikTok, and then I'll watch the next one, and the next one, and I don't understand how it reads my mind. Sometimes it's giving me marital advice, and sometimes it's baking advice, and sometimes it's dating advice, dieting advice, all connected somehow. All of these companies that we engage with casually play a role in the harm that Muslims are experiencing today. These platforms and the people who run them don't care about you. They care about their profits. We've seen the implosion at Twitter recently. Oh, it was so exciting. They banned the former president from the platform. How quick were they ready to sell? How quick were they ready to sell to someone who is clearly unhinged, who wants to bring the president back, who can't make sense of anything, who's losing his own nuts and bolts on Twitter itself. How quickly were they willing to go? Oh, they have algorithms that will protect us. No, over and over again what we see is that the algorithms continue to put forward hate. That the censors and the moderators somehow continue to let white supremacist messaging through and let Zionist messaging through and let Hindutva messaging through and that's how it spreads in these communities. That there are online communities of groups that hate us. There's no gentle way to put it. They hate us and they want to harm us. And Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, I don't think anyone uses MySpace anymore, but all of these places are where this is happening. Now we have a choice. We can walk away from the platforms altogether. But I told you that my entry point into them was freedom, freedom movements. My entry point into them was human rights movements. And so I'm not willing to forego my voice. I'm not willing to forego the opportunity to connect with all of you. One tweet that you send today that says, I loved being at ICNA Mass could inspire someone to come next year. One tweet that you send today that says, free, free Palestine could inspire someone else to speak up. One message can have a ripple effect. And so I'm here to tell you, it's not all bad. Yes, 
it's very bad. But if we look at the incredible progress of the Black Lives Matter movement, where did that begin? A hashtag. Now, police officers know that they will be recorded, know that their badge will be put up online, know that people will find out where they live and protest at their houses. Police officers are being held accountable through social media in a way that, frankly, our courts failed to do. And it all began with a hashtag. But there's a reason we know Breonna Taylor's name. There's a reason we know Freddie Gray's name. There's a reason we know Oscar Grant's name. Because somebody did something and said, I'm not going to wait for CNN or NBC or Fox News to cover this. I'm going to do something about it myself. And change takes so long. I don't want to tell you that we've saved the world overnight or that you'll do it tomorrow or next week. We will very likely still be having many of these conversations at the next convention. But today, we know more about the movement for black lives than we did before social media's onset. It's not that the killings began when Twitter opened up. It's that we started talking about them and we started to share about them. In Palestine, how many of you had heard of Sheikh Jarrah before we started talking about Sheikh Jarrah online? Unless you're Palestinian, most of you, I assume, had no idea. I consider myself a dedicated Palestine activist and I did not know where that city was. I had visited the country and I did not know where that city was. But when the occupiers came and they said, we're going to kick you out of your houses, Palestinians said, we will tell the world. When Shari Abu, Shirin Abu Akleh was killed a couple of weeks ago, why did we all know about it? Because somebody filmed it and put it out there. We are slowly seeing a shift in the conversation on Palestine. And it's not happening because the Zionism has subsided. It is not happening because the Israeli government has said, oh, okay, we'll take a step back. It's not happening because we're sending less money. It's happening because we're having these conversations. It's happening because we're saying, your tools are also available to us. These platforms, we can take advantage of. This hashtag, this conversation, this algorithm, we will game it. And we will use it to push forward the narrative that we believe in, the narrative of justice. And of course, very recently this week, in the tragedy that happened in Uvalde, those city officials, those police officers, the conversation about the budget in that city is happening because the parents went on social media and said, how? How did they stand by and let our children be murdered in cold blood? The conversation around mass shootings is different because we're having it together. And so social media can be used for horrible things. It is in fact used for horrible things. And we need to hold the platforms accountable for permitting those things to happen. When you see hate speech online, report it. And then report it, and then report it, and then report it. Why do you think your stuff gets taken down? Why do you think it's difficult to get a post about Palestine through on Instagram? Because on the other side, they're reporting and reporting and reporting. So you do the same. When your elected officials talk about accountability for these social media conglomerates, you voice your concerns. When someone says that I want to join, you warn them of the cautions. We have a responsibility to use social media cautiously. But we also have an opportunity to use it to advance justice. Practically speaking, what does all of this mean? Every single one of you, I imagine, is on a social media platform. Let's count WhatsApp too. Just in case someone is sitting in the audience being like, no, 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 no I'm not on anything. I don't believe you you're at least on WhatsApp. I have yet to meet a Muslim in our community who is not on WhatsApp. Every single one of you is on social media. This is hard. This is overwhelming. Every time you open it, there is bad news. And I agree with Sheikh Suleiman that it is much harder to be multi-generational in a refugee camp in Palestine. It is much harder to be innocent and behind bars in the United States for decades. 
it is much harder to be in a quote-unquote re-education camp in China. Social media can be hard. It is much harder to be living those realities. So don't walk away from them, but manage your wellness. Control your input, control your intake. Manage how much you do, don't doom scroll, don't just keep scrolling for the sake of scrolling. Time how long you are on the platform. If it is impacting you, take a break. But a break means that you come back. You come back and you have the conversations, you come back and you do the work, you come back and you use the tools that are available to you. Manage your wellness because as hard as it feels, it is harder to be in one of those far more oppressed realities. So there's a balance that's required. Remember your rights on these platforms. You're a consumer. You signed an agreement. They can take your content down. Make sure that you have it backed up. But you also have a right to speak out. You have a right to report content. You have a right to appeal the takedown of your content. You have a right to be a full participant. Remember the consequences. I always say to young people that we work with around social media, that if it leaves your lips or fingertips, it is forever. Allah is most merciful, the general public is not. I will screenshot it if you put up something ridiculous and maybe send it to your mom. Someone else, like the Zionists at Canary Mission, will send it to your employer. Like the FBI agent trying to make an arrest, will send it to his boss asking if he can come visit you. I don't say any of this to scare you. I say it to remind you that we have a responsibility that we have to navigate carefully. You have a right to use the platforms. You should use them responsibly. And what do you do when you're on there? This is maybe the most important thing that should drive our social media engagement. And it is to remember your purpose. One of the greatest jihads is to speak out against tyrants. But tyrants or not, we are commanded to speak out firmly for justice. Whether it is, whether the oppressor or the oppressed is our brother or sister. So we must speak out for justice and we must continually act for justice with our hands, with our tongues, in our hearts. You can see how the people who want to harm us are using social media. But you can also see the promise and the opportunity that social media creates for us. We've bridged freedom struggles across continents. Some of you may remember when the people in Ferguson, Missouri were expressing solidarity with the people in Palestine. Some of you may remember how people across the country are speaking out for voting rights. Some of you are seeing this week how all of us are heartbroken about what happened in Uvalde. Don't walk away from social media. Be cautious of its consequences. Be understanding of its power and then use it to work for justice for our brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair.